Okay, thanks for tuning in. Anthony Lewis has again joined me, and we're going to be doing some examples of primary directions. Uh, thanks, Anthony, for joining me. It's a pleasure. Okay, my pleasure. Uh, so, at your request, you were interested in a couple of charts, so I prepared yeah. some slides on them. Uh, Justin Bieber and Sharon Tate. And I'll be using the tropical zodiac because mm -hmm. since that's what I'm more familiar with. I know you work with them in the sidereal. So it'll be interesting to see the comparison. Let sure. me, sh go ahead. No, no, no. Oh, no, let no, me no. share my screen uh, and go to my, okay. Can you see my screen here? Yeah, 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 it's, it's there. Okay. Uh, so I thought <laughs> it would be best just to begin with a little review of what is a primary direction. Yeah, sure. I think uh, uh, we can surely do do a recap or something like that here. Yeah. But uh, this will if, be very, very brief. <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, if if someone has not watched the previous video, you can you can always go and watch. And one more video that I'd surely recommend is Anthony Lewis has done uh, an introductory video to primary direction on Levi Kozan's channel, which was one of the finest videos that I've ever seen. Oh, on prime. Okay. Obviously, we have very few videos on primary directions. But I think we should, um, uh, the video on uh, what we did and the one which you did with Levi uh, seems to be uh, complementing each other in terms of how to work with the basics of primary mm -hmm. directions. So what, yeah, what you I, explained astrologically here, you kind of covered the astronomical part and mm -hmm. uh, in Levi's channel. So it seems to be a fantastic complementing uh, video. So, so yeah, I just wanted to mention this point because it's important for people to just go back and watch those videos if they've not done. So. Yeah, and also the video you did with Martin Ganston is excellent mm -hmm. and worth. He goes over all the basics, and that's worth looking at too. Yeah, and uh, I think I mean the the main thing that uh, pushes me to do primary directions is because I think everyone should probably every astrologer should probably kind of venture into primary directions and kind of see uh, how. Um, actually, we are aligned with the universe, and on the other hand, uh, it is. It seems to be mathematically very complicated, but you seem to say that it's very easy. But <laughs> uh, that's the. Uh, I think that is a contradicting, contradicting opinion that many people will have. So, <laughs> but the thing is, uh, I think it's a very humbling experience if an astrologer learns uh, primary directions. So that mm -hmm. is one. That is something that I would. Uh, stress upon and I'm very glad that primary directions is kind of you know uh, it's it's gaining popularity which mm -hmm. and rightfully so so well yeah it's it actually is a very easy concept and I think the problem modern astrologers have is we have all learned astrology with flat charts circles or mm -hmm. squares like the Indian chart or the western chart and it's in a plane it's in a flat surface but reality is in three dimensions. Sure. And I think the ancient astrologers were used to thinking in three dimensions because they mm -hmm. observed the sky. They would actually go out and look at where the planets were and how they rose and set and where they were with respect to each other. And that was always in a three-dimensional space. They were looking at a dome, the yeah. dome of the heavens. And so that was their reference system we got used to, well, like here, a circle or a square chart that's on a flat piece of paper. So what we're missing that the astrologers 2,000 years ago had as part of their automatic uh, view was um, this three-dimensional viewpoint. Mm. And so, so let's look at this diagram, because this is in two dimensions and it's trying to depict what's happening in three dimensions. And very simply, here is a person somewhere on Earth. And so his horizon is this horizontal line here. And mm -hmm. if you were an ancient astrologer, you'd be standing on your horizon and you'd be looking east to see what is rising above the horizon. Mm -hmm. Here's a star, for instance. So at some point, this star was below the horizon, and it came over the horizon. And then it rose, and at some point, it will get to the midheaven, mm -hmm. which is the upper meridian, 
and then it will sink again, and at some point it will set here and go below the horizon. And that's obviously in three dimensions. And what primary directions simply are, it's the idea that at birth, all the stars in your chart are at certain locations. And so let's say this is a birth chart and this star, whatever it is, is here. It could be mm -hmm. a star, it could be Venus, it could be Sirius, it could be any point in the sky. Mm -hmm. Then this has some fixed meaning for your life. It contains some promise for your life, astrologically, symbolically. And as the earth turns, the earth turns from west to east. So the sky appears to rotate from east to west. So as the earth turns on its axis, and this is the equator and this is the earth's axis, mm. the earth is turning this way, like my cursor is going. Yeah. Mm. The stars are rising, culminating and setting. So you're born with this star here. It has risen way back here and it's gonna culminate up here. So it's maybe, let's estimate two thirds of the way to the midheaven. Mm. At some point it will reach the midheaven. Now the midheaven is a very powerful point in a chart. So when this star reaches the midheaven, you would expect something to occur in the person's life that symbolically matches the meaning of that star and the midheaven. Okay. And that's all a primary direction is. Okay. When will this star, which after birth continues to rise in the moments after birth or the hours after birth, reach the midheaven? or reach some other important point in your chart. And then we say the star got directed to the midheaven and say the star is Venus and it takes, you know, a couple of hours to get up here. Mm. And uh, what Ptolemy did is he said each degree of the equator that passes over the midheaven corresponds to a year of life. That's a symbolic equation. Mm. So in two hours, uh, it takes about four minutes for a degree on the equator to go over the midheaven. Two hours correlate. Each hour is about 15 degrees. Two hours is 30 degrees. So we might say, just looking at this chart, about age 30, this person might marry because Venus is on the midheaven. There's some public event involving Venus, sure. maybe a wedding or maybe an important relationship. Mm. Or if Venus has some other meaning in the chart, say Venus rules the fifth house, Maybe he'll have a child that year. Mm. Okay. And, and so that was the simple observation. We watch where the stars were at birth. And then as the earth turns after birth, it makes a complete rotation every 24 hours. Uh, uh, and each hour is 15 degrees or 15 years of life. Uh, when the planets match up to their, the natal positions of the other planets with reference, always with reference to the meridian and horizon of the person, sure. then the primary direction is perfect and the event should occur in that time period. In many ways, it's like a Dasha system. It's, mm -hmm. Primary directions are really precise to the day, but usually they show a several month period or even a year period in which an event is likely to occur. So this person, if this were 30 degrees on the equator to get from here to here, and this were Venus, we might say around age 30, I expect you to get married or involved in an important relationship. Mm. And then you would look at the solar returns and the transits and other, you know, the Dasha system, whatever system you're using for prediction to try to pinpoint that period around age 30 when this primary direction becomes uh, mm -hmm. comes to fruition. So basically that's all it is. We're taking the birth chart as the sort of basic map of how your life will go and we're letting everything move after birth by the rotation of the earth. And because we're letting one degree be a year of life, in 90 degrees you're only going to go through a quarter of the chart. So we're probably the whole lifespan is going to be within three or four houses for most people. Right? Mm. Uh, sure. So that's the basic idea. And then the, the complicated part comes in, how do you measure when planets or planets 
two planets are aligned or when a planet aligns with the midheaven or the ascendant. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's actually quite easy. With the midheaven, whenever the planet culminates, it's, you've got a conjunction with the midheaven, and that's a primary direction to the midheaven. So you just measure where the planet is at birth, where the, uh, on the equator. We, we measure with respect to the equator. That's called right ascension. Mm -hmm. What's the position of the planet projected onto the equator? And then what's the position of the uh, midheaven on the equator, you measure that arc, convert it to years, and that's when it occurs. With the ascendants, it's a little more complicated, but that not that much. If this star rose here, uh, and we're, we're measuring stars on the ecliptic, I, I didn't show the ecliptic in this diagram, the point on the equator that rose at the same time as the star uh, would be called its oblique ascension. Oblique ascension oblique because the stars are tra you know the stars being the planets in this case are traveling around the ecliptic and the ecliptic is angled at 23 and a half degrees to the equator so when you project that onto the equator you get a kind of distortion from projection and oblique ascension is simply when when a point or a planet is on the horizon when it's just rising what degree of the equator is also on the horizon at that exact moment, and that's the oblique ascension. And so for directions to the horizon or the ascendant, you measure time in oblique ascension as opposed to right ascension. Okay. But it's still measured along the equator. Mm. Uh, I think that'll become clear in the examples, but that's the basic idea. The difficulty comes when two planets are intermediate between the meridian and the horizon then we can't really use right ascension on the equator because we're not going to the uh, midheaven. We can't use oblique ascension because we're not measuring the distance from the ascendant. We're measuring two intermediate points. And what Ptolemy said, well, let's use proportions. So like in, in this case, we said this star is about two thirds of the way from the horizon. Mm, to almost the midheaven. Midheaven, yeah. So if we had another star say over here, when would this, these two stars align? Well, when the second star, wherever it was, got to the point on its daily path mm. uh, between the horizon and the meridian, then we would say they align. Sure. Okay. And if you think about road travel, it's an easy analogy. If you're traveling mm. from one city to another, say you're going from Mumbai to Delhi by a car, and I say to you, I'm going to meet you two thirds of the way between Mumbai and Delhi in India. Mm. But I'm driving a slow car and you're driving a fast car. So mm. we're both going to get to that point, but at different times because sure. we're traveling different speeds. But when we, when I'm two thirds of the way, then I'm aligned with where you will be when you're two thirds of the way. And when you get two thirds of the way, we'll be conjunct. So it's working with proportions, yeah. Sure. Yeah, with proportions. And uh, that's how Ptolemy did it. That's how Placidus did it. Mm. Reggio Montanus, I know you're reading the Marinus book. He mm. used the Reggio Montanus system. Okay. He uses a different way to align planets intermediate between the midheaven and the horizon, which I don't want to get into now. Okay, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> it's just, it's, it'll take us too far afield. <laughs> so let's look at Justin Bieber. Uh, I actually know very little about Justin Bieber. I'm not a particular fan. Uh, he's been in the news, and I know he's kind of a, he's had his difficulties. <laughs> yeah, sure. I know that there was a one point where he got arrested or in trouble, and there was a petition to the White House to deport him back to Canada. Okay. But that aside, <laughs> uh, I looked him up on the internet, and these are some important years of his life. Uh, I assume most people know who he is. He's a singer, a young singer who was very popular, became very popular at a very young age. Mm. Born in 1994, March 1st. I, he apparently began posting YouTube videos that got discovered by a scout. Uh, so in 2007, he was 13 years old and this talent manager happened to come across his YouTube videos, thought he was very talented and invited him to the United States. 
Uh, and I made a note here, we'll see this. At age 13, his primary directed midheaven changed signs between the time he was 13 and 14. Mm. Uh, that's significant because whenever by primary direction or probably in general by transit, uh, there's a change of sign, there's a major shift in the life. And especially by primary direction, since they're slow, so slow moving, when your midheaven changes from one sign to another, it, there's usually some major effect on your career, your public standing. Mm. So we'll see that in a minute. Uh, so a year later, so he comes to the United States, he's, he signs a contract, he's now 14. He releases an album which becomes uh, very, very popular uh, in 2010. It's a triple platinum. So here he's 14, 15, 16 years old. He becomes this like world famous uh, teen pop star. Mm -hmm. And then four years later, he's 20. He gets some of his legal problems. He gets arrested and people want to deport him back to Canada. <laughs> Okay, so we'll okay. keep these dates. Yeah, they are very major humans. Uh, so this is his natal chart. This is it tropical. I got this from astrodeans, astro.com. Uh, he has Scorpio rising, the very late degree of Scorpio rising in the tropical zodiac. Uh, his 10th whole sign house, which would be connected to his career, is Leo. But his midheaven is in Virgo. So these two signs are very important to his career. Uh, and the midheaven, as I said, if we direct the chart, which is we, we let everything rise in the chart toward from moving from the horizon toward the midheaven. So af this is a chart at birth. After birth, we let this continue to advance. So like the hands of a clock, this will tick forward one degree of uh, right ascension every year of life. And as you can see, just by eyeballing it, the midheaven is about the middle of Virgo. And so this is roughly 15 degrees 15. on the ecliptic. Uh, if we measure it on the equator, we project it down to the equator. This shift is going to take place from Virgo to Libra. Uh, in the year, in October of 2007. I remember he's discovered it early in 2007. He signs a contract in 2008. So this, this period, October 2007, and usually several months, I usually use six months either side of that, oh, sure. should, should be a major period. So I'd say mid-2007 to mid-2008, roughly. Major oh. period for his career. Uh, it's also significant that he shifts from Mercury ruling his MC to Venus ruling his MC. Uh, Mercury in his chart is it's in a cadent house, conjunct Mars, whereas Venus is exalted in Pisces. And it's quite angular. It's very close to the um, fourth cusp. It's in an angular house in the mm. quadrant system. And uh, I think it's also, it's trying to Jupiter and it's sextile to Neptune and Uranus. So Venus is quite powerful in this chart mm -hmm. and quite um, dignified. It's got nice aspects and it's in the sign of exaltation in the tropical system. Uh, I'm not sure in the sidereal how Venus does, but, no. but I, I, I use tropical, so let's stick to that for now. And this is like, say, 13 and a half to 14 and a half. Uh, we have this change of sign here. Okay. Uh, this, oh, there's an interesting site um, online. It's, it's in Spanish, but you can, if you don't speak Spanish, I think you can use Google Translate to translate. What you can do is you can put in the birth chart data and the date of an event and it will generate the birth chart inside and the primary directed chart outside. It's called Carta Dash Natal ES for España, I guess. And this is the kind of chart it generates. 
So inside we have Justin Bieber's birth chart that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. There's the Venus that gets activated here. And I set the outside chart for October of 2007. And this is the directed midheaven, as you can see, it's changing sign in October. It's going from Virgo to Libra. So this is a major, major period for his career. And in terms of his history, it fits. He shifted from kind of a, a Virgo career uh, period to a Venus career Venus. period. Venus obviously is singing, it's popularity. Sure. Um, and, more, more, uh, on, more on public spectrum. Right. Uh, and Venus as is in the natal chart is angular and exalted. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and uh, I think uh, first five degrees um, of of the Libra is ruled by Saturn. If you talk about the Egyptian, I think it terms. is. Yeah, yeah. We'll look, we'll look at the that in a second. So let me move okay. on. We looked at that. What you're talking about now is the. the Hellenistic astrologers divided each sign into five unequal segments ruled by the five non-luminous planets. Uh, and so he's born. I think we just lost you for, for a moment. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, it's, it's fine now. Uh, yeah, can, can you just say what is it? Okay, I, what I was saying, sorry to get lost there. I don't know if it has a problem from my side or your side. So it's, or it might be a connection problem. Yeah. The internet sometimes does this. Mm. This is a technique from Hellenistic times. They looked at, as the earth turned after birth, what parts of the signs were rising to the ascendant. And they use it as kind of a, like a dasha system. So he's born with his ascendant at the end of Scorpio, which belongs to Saturn, the terms of Saturn, a five-part division of each sign. Mm. He then moves into a Jupiter period that lasts till 2010. Uh, and again, 2010 is significant because that's a year that he became very prominent uh, publicly. And 2010 in June, he enters the Venus terms of Sagittarius. And so this is the period of his great popularity and uh, success. It lasts for several years. Uh, and so in, what if in 2007, the Midheaven shifted into Libra, making Venus prominent. And then in 2010, a year of immense success for him. He's in the Venus term of Saturn. So he's got this like Venus, Venus uh, yeah. emphasis. So Venus becomes very prominent in the chart. Yeah. And uh, here's the, 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 this is the same information laid out in a table form. I did this, there's a program called Janus, J-A-N-U-S. Mm -hmm. And so they let you put in uh the, the span of years you're looking at, I did from zero to 39. Uh, okay. So he's born in the terms of Saturn, as we said, in 94. A year later, he moves into his Jupiter period. He stays in Jupiter until 2010. Now, in this period, a couple of aspects hit the directed ascendant, the square of Saturn, and then the square Sorry. of the moon. And it's around this period where he's post posting things on the internet that get noticed. And then he goes into his Venus period, which lasts to 2016. So it's a six year period. Mm. And this is a year of immense popularity, publicity, success as a musician. Sure. Uh, 
And I think in 2016 is when he gets arrested. He goes into his Mercury period <laughs> and gets oh, arrested no. for... Uh, let me go back. because I, I think it's it 2014. Oh, 2014. Okay. I was wrong. So he's still in the Venus period. Okay. Yeah. So 2014, he's in the, okay. Let me continue. And, uh, okay. Yeah, but, but Venus is also ruling the uh, 12th house and 12th house directly indicates jail. With with right. the, with yeah. the twelfth lot being so prominent, mm -hmm. um, um, I think it it also indicates some kind of hardships, which is mm -hmm. yeah yeah right, right, right. Venus is in his whole sign twelfth. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it rules his whole sign twelfth. Yeah, I'm rules sorry. the whole yeah yeah, but it, it rules his quadrant house eleventh. So it's also a period of great. Uh, gain and influence and uh, financial uh, gain. We did that one. We did okay. Uh, the sun happened to square the ascendant in July of 2008. So this is again the period where he gets discovered and signs the contract. Uh, let's see. Oh, 2004. So here's when he gets in trouble with the police. Okay. Pluto, which is stationary mm. at birth and on the ascendant. So it's a very powerful planet in his life. Uh, is at the end of Scorpio. So it squares the end of Aquarius. Mm. And Venus, I think, comes to Pluto to that square sure. in 2014 when he gets arrested. Which I thought was interesting. Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. I mean, yeah. And Pluto can be uh, power figures. You know. uh, Pluto's also god of the underworld. So, mm. uh, I, I didn't. Don't think I calculated the exact. Oh, yes, I did. Here. Here's the oh. 2014 uh, directions. These are calculated in Janus. Uh, so what do we have going on in 2014? It's a, he's got a lot of squares going on. Uh, I think he got arrested early in the year, like January, then mid-year and early summer. Mm. Uh, and uh, one was for drunken driving or driving under the influence, and another was for throwing eggs at a neighbor. He got a <laughs> fight with a neighbor and threw eggs at him, and the police ever got involved. Um, oh, here's the Venus square, the Pluto. Yeah, it was in March. But then he has squares to Nep Jupiter, Neptune, and the midheaven opposes the Mercury. Mercury. So, so this is a difficult year, except for these points. Well, no, this is 2013. And the year begins okay. I mean, a trine of, of Mercury to the Ascendant in January is very nice. That could be some sort of success in communication or maybe had a successful, I don't know what he did at that time. <clears throat> but then the rest of the year is all squares and oppositions. Okay. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Okay. So I thought it was interesting how the the chart really does reflect his major events in his life. Uh, so let's move on to Sharon Tate. Or did you have other thoughts about Justin Bieber first? No, 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 no. I think, uh, I think it was very really clearly done because you had showed the tables when uh, kind of there is configurations with other birth points. So it was great. Okay. Let me, let me go back a minute to Justin Bieber because I think what's useful if you just look at this chart and you don't, without doing any calculation, you can see that the midheaven probably sometime in his teens is going to change direction, change sign, I mean, change sign. And so just eyeballing the chart, you can have a sense of this person 
probably around mid-teens, some major career event is going to occur in his life. And um, you can do that with other things. Like the Ascendant is going to meet up with Jupiter. Jupiter is what, around mid-Scorpio. So this also, I didn't calculate this direction, but at some point, the Ascendant is going to meet mid-Scorpio, and that's probably going to be early teens as well. Ascendant connecting to Jupiter should be a very positive uh, period in his life. And then you do the calculations and you try to pinpoint dates. But just by eyeballing the chart and, and letting it rotate like a clock, you can get a sense of how events will unfold and roughly when, like early life, teens, young adulthood, midlife, so on. Okay. Let's move on to Sharon Tate. Let me, where did I put her? Okay, Sharon Tate, uh, I guess she's most famous for having been murdered by the Manson family, yeah. Charles Manson. Uh, she was murdered on August 9th at, I think, 005 minutes in the morning. So that it had just changed from August 8th to August 9th. It was five minutes into August 9th in, in California, stabbed to death, and she was pregnant at the time. Uh, so it became quite a notorious murder. And um, so I thought it would be useful to look at the date of her murder and the primary directions. So mm -hmm. that should show up. This is her birth chart. Okay. Uh, and she was, I think, 26 when she died. Yeah. So, um, and so, I don't see anything obviously quickly, except that what I'm looking for is, I'm taking age 26 and thinking 26 degrees is just under a whole sign in the ecliptic. So it's probably roughly a whole sign in the, um, equator with distortion mm -hmm. it could be a little more a little less and i'm looking at is there anything near an angle that's about 26 degrees well there's nothing near the midheaven sure. near the ascendant there's pluto but i think that's too close that's going to come to the ascendant before well before she's 26 i think but i might be wrong because pluto ha can have great latitude and it can so one possibility is that Pluto meets the Ascendant at age 26, mm. and that correlates to his, her death. Uh, there's nothing moving toward the IC. It's possible the moon is about 26 degrees on the equator from the IC, so maybe the moon to the meridian, maybe there's a... Um, but I think suddenly sun falls below the horizon when, when she died. Uh, which is one mm -hmm. of those, not not the major indicator, but it, it could easily be one of those indicator. Um, right. yeah. but, but I'm looking for a direction that becomes exact around age 26. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's possible the fourth cusp, the IC, reached the moon at age 26. And here with Mars, it's possible Mars reached the, connected with the descent at the descent. horizon at age 26. Mm. So those are possibilities. Um, so let's move on. Here are her distributions, which again are starting with the chart. Here's her birth chart. So she's born with in the, the ascendant in the terms of Jupiter. Then it goes to Saturn. Then it goes to Jupiter and Leo. Then Venus and Leo. Then Saturn and Leo in 1969, so she's in a Saturn, whoops, didn't mean to do that. I just screwed up my slide here. <laughs> uh. That's right. So in 1969, at age 26, this part of her birth chart has risen to the horizon. Mm. So her ascendant is now here in Leo, but in the Saturn term of Leo. Now. So Saturn is usually a, a, a somewhat difficult period. I mean, Saturn is the ruler of seventh and eighth house, and that directly means uh, right. You know, yeah. so right. Saturn something. rules yeah. seven and eight, so it's a uh, it could be a killer planet. Sure. And, um, 
and she's in the sign, the ascendant is in the sign Leo, and Leo is in the eighth whole sign, but the seventh yeah. uh, uh, quadrant. Mm -hmm. So that these are indications of possible death. We're not going to guarantee her death. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was interested in Mars and the, Mars getting to the horizon by direct or converse direction because Mars is at 28 degrees and the horizon is at 21 degrees. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so 21 plus two degrees in here is 22 degrees on the ecliptic. That could stretch out to 26 on the equator. Mm. Okay. So let's, let's look. So I went to that site I talked about, the uh, Carta Natal, put in mm. her birth data here in the center, and August 9th, the date of her death outside. And what we see is this is the directed ascendant, mm. and it's exactly across from Mars, Mars. on the day she dies. Well, that, it's not exact. The directed ascendant is at 2830 of Gemini, and Mars is at 2839. So it's off by nine minutes of arc. Uh, mm. I would consider that almost exact. <laughs> sure. you know, and her, her birth time is given to the nearest minute. So if she were born, <laughs> say, 30 seconds sooner or later, it could have been, this could be exact. But, but uh, I think, as you said, it's, it's counted as, and uh, the mode of death also is, is, is kind of very... Um, Understandable if you see how we associate Mars with, you know, uh, right. being stabbed and all those things. So. Mars has to do with violence, with stabbing. Sure. Uh, it's in her <clears throat> quadrant six, but in her whole sign fifth, right? Fifth. Yeah, fifth, fifth house. No, it's her whole sign. Her whole sign sixth. It's in her both her quadrant and whole sign sixth, because this is her seventh. Mm. So Mars does have a sixth house connotation, and it does have to do with stabbings. Sure. And in her chart, it rules her her tenth. Um, yeah, it's fifth and tenth. Sixth and tenth. Yeah. Fifth, fifth. I was counting whole signs and quadrants. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. It, 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 no, it, it rules her. Fifth, fifth and right? tenth, fifth and tenth, yeah. It rules her fifth. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five. five yeah. In both. And fifth is children, and her her unborn child was also stabbed to death mm. in the process. Um, these are her primaries. This will give us the intermediate primaries. Uh, according to this, this is the Nibod rate. Uh, the ascendant opposed Mars in February by the Nibod rate. She died in what August? Um, mm. Yeah, August ninth. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and here, no, this is by direct. I did both direct and converse. Um, by direct, it was. I'll show you what it means. It was in February, and by converse, it was in June, which is very close to the time she died. To go back to the chart, if we move the chart forward, then the ascendant rises to here, and in February, it opposes Mars. Mm -hmm. If we do the converse, which is we... No, I'm sorry, that, that was the converse. <laughs> okay. If we let the ascendant rise, instead of holding it fixed, that's called the converse direction, and that's in June, it perfects. If we keep the ascendant fixed mm. and let Mars uh, no. move, it will oppose the... Uh, I'm getting confused. <laughs> no, I think Mars will also oppose the uh, ascendant at similar kind of time, if you see... Uh, no, if we... Yeah. The opposition of the ascendant is really the descendant. Yeah. If we let the descendant move toward Mars, 
that would be the um, the direct right. Mm. And if we let Mars move, well, anyway, I'm just confusing people. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, yeah. I think the time frame is matching if you kind of yeah. uh, look at the motion from either side. So. Right. And uh, let's see. In November, she had the opposition of, so this was the IC came to the moon. Okay, that, that occurred in November after the death. Mm. Uh, the moon is her ascendant ruler. So this point here came to the moon, but it reached it in November. And does that have anything to do with death? I don't know. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> I don't think a whole lot, no. Mm. But she had already been killed by that. Yeah, so. doesn't matter. But the important thing is the Mars and the ascend, uh, the, the horizon line connected in 1969, very close to her death. Yeah, and I that think even in the sidereal chart that uh, that I wrote, um, Mars had a very important role to play, but I don't remember mm -hmm. exactly how. And these are the positions generated by this site, uh, Astro, what is it? The Carta. Spanish site, yeah. And so they calculate, oh, I know what the difference is, okay. I think that this is without, OL means without latitude, okay. Okay. So when you're doing primary directions, there's two ways to, to think of them. You can think of their point on the ecliptic and when does that meet with the horizon. So Mars here stands for the, the projection of Mars onto the ecliptic. There's no latitude. Mm. In this site, they're actually using the latitude of the planet. They're using its actual place in space instead mm. of its projection onto the ecliptic. If you use the latitude where the body of the planet really is in space, uh, then you can see that it, it lines up almost exactly with the... Um, yeah the ascendant with the horizon i think that was that's this map here yeah the the nine degrees uh sorry right. the nine minute difference yeah so i always look at both with and without latitude because mm. with one you're you're just working on the ecliptic and not straying off the ecliptic and looking at the projections on the ecliptic but if but i think it's important where the planet really is in space and mm -hmm. if far above or below the ecliptic, it's going to meet up with the horizon at a different time of the year. Sure. So these were two examples. Um, I hope they're clear. I think this was very impressive that Mars came to the directed horizon sure. uh, within weeks of the time of her death. It was, mm. Okay. Because this was June 3rd and she died August 9th. So that's about a month apart. No, I'm sorry. June 12th, right? She died. No, it's, it's like almost two months. Close August 9th. So it's, it's less than a month. And in primaries, that's pretty exact. That's very close. Yeah. Sure. Uh, okay. So those are the two examples I had prepared. Uh, okay. Were there other things you wanted to bring up or go over? Or? Um, um, I don't think, but um, I was just looking for the sidereal chart of Sharon Tate. Oh yeah, that would be interesting to look at. Um, the sidereal chart of who? Sharon Tate? Yeah, sidereal chart of Sharon Tate. Uh, let, let me check. Uh, I should have it somewhere. If you don't have it readily, I can probably find one. Uh, okay, but um, I should have it saved. Okay. Have you found it? Uh, okay, one moment, I think. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, you got it? Yes. Yeah, it's here. Let's 
Let me just open both. I probably open the three charts that I have. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, the idea behind primary directions is that the chart kind of, it's like when we grow up, we're mm. born and we have potential, then at certain periods of life, something happens to trigger that potential. Uh, for instance, um, if you think of hormones, when you're an adolescent, your sex hormones kick in and you develop secondary sex characteristics. They're potentially mm. there in the birth chart, but they don't manifest until the testosterone uh, comes into play, mm. uh, as an example. Okay, let me just share my screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you see it now? Um, yes. So this is Sharon from the uh, sidereal. Yes. Okay. Right. So. Mars, I mean, it's the same houses. It's in the sixth. Oh, Mars is in seventh. What? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Mars is in seventh. Well, it's always in the seventh. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, Mars is in the seventh. All right. Uh, the, the direction is still going to be the same. It's going to be Mars sure. comes to the horizon. Mm. Uh, and Mars here rules the sixth and the uh, eleventh. That's interesting. Yeah, sixth and beyond. And so. And uh, and we have, uh, I think we have. Uh, it's so the Lord of the Ascendant is in the eighth house. In a deep combust state, so which is mm -hmm. which is a very important indication of uh, uh, you know longevity. So, you know, not very conducive for longevity. Mm -hmm. You know, and the the other direction was that the the meridian came to the moon in November, which is a few months after she died, mm -hmm. and the moon here rules the second and is squared by Saturn from the 12th. Yeah. So that's, that's a somewhat dangerous direction. Sure. It's still with an orb because she died in August, September, October, November. Three months is still with an orb, I would think. Mm. I usually use, let's say, about six months before and after the directions for okay. the period of when they're likely to manifest. Sure. Um, and I think I have the directed chart as well, if you want to see. Sure, yeah. So outside is a directed chart. Uh, one moment, let me just see. No, this is not the one. Yeah, this is the one. This is just the directed chart. So mm -hmm. there is no inner and outer wheels. So okay. Um. I mean, yeah. the, the, I think the ascendant is in the terms of Mercury and Mercury in the natal chart is, mm -hmm. is deeply combust and is also placed in the eighth house. So, mm -hmm. so, which is one of the major indicators. And if you also look at the directed chart, uh, both Sun and Mercury have significantly fallen below the horizon, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of a setting zone and is also an indication of, uh, you know, setting or end of something. Mm -hmm. so, I don't know if it is, it, it, it might not be a very, you know, direct indicator, but it's a symbolic indicator of, yeah, like yeah. things are kind of you know, closing in. So, yeah, that, that, that's what I thought. So. Mm. so. I think you really have to compare the directed chart to the natal chart to see what's getting activated. Yeah. Uh, one moment. Mm -hmm. 
uh, i don't think i have that wheel but here is the this is the solar wheel i think natal and solar wheel solar revolutions wheel oh okay so so what inside is natal inside outer, is natal yes is solar revolution for 60 yeah. 1969 yeah exactly yeah okay so yeah again if if you look at mercury as yes, time lord so we see how mercury is placed so so what's the ascendant in 69 i i'm not seeing it it's sorry her solar revolution ascendant is that uh, it, one it's hard to, i don't see solar revolution ascendant is it should be here somewhere oh it's not here i i don't see it um oh uh, it's weird <laughs> no i don't think it's here okay um i think it's very difficult to kind of see this she well, she's in a she's 26 so her perfection would be the sun right uh, she would be in a leo perfection yeah. year yes third house actually yeah and that would place the sun in the sixth house of the perfected chart Yeah, and then her natal midheaven would be in the eighth house of the perfected chart. So that uh, uh, stresses eighth house issues. Yeah, I'm sure. And um, and. Oh, and then let's see. She has Mars in the, the um, solar return, square to Mercury, very closely square to Mercury uh, in the solar return, right? Yeah. So there's a Mars square Mercury. And Mercury is her... Right, so it's a very tight square, yes. Actually, I didn't notice that. Yeah, Mercury but... is her ascendant ruler, so that that's a... There's a risk of a Mars-like event, yeah, sure. stressful Mars-like event, to the mm. uh, uh, the ascendant ruler being squared almost exactly by Mars could yeah. be a cut, a wound to the body. Yeah. Mm. Um, okay. And uh, let's see. Well, that helps. Yeah, it's it's tiny print. It's hard for me to see. The, okay. The yeah. 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 Uh, do you see other things? That's just. Uh, no, uh, I don't think I mentioned a lot of solar return stuff, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question. When you do solar returns, do you use the sidereal zodiac or the tropical to for the year, the length of the year? No, I just stick to the sidereal. The sidereal, okay. Because yeah. they give different charts. So. Yeah. Um, okay. okay. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, I, I didn't think I'd actually uh, share anything, but I just, since you opened Sharon did, so I thought it would be interesting mm -hmm. to compare the similarities, but maybe I should do, uh, or maybe we should do a separate thing on uh, Sharon Tate's IPV as well. So. Yeah, and again, I generally don't use the sidereal, so I'm mm. not that familiar with it. And sure. I'm sure if I were, we'd see other things. Or... Sure. Okay. So I think that pretty much brings us towards the end of the 
um, video. So, yeah, uh, along with that, I think you your book on uh, primary directions is also very uh, important. So, actually, uh, as a matter of fact, I think I would suggest your book as uh, as the first book to kind of enter into <laughs> and then get into uh, Martin Gansman's book and then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Maureen's book. So, so it would right. be a good ladder to climb in terms of so because you cover the basics very um, you know easily and kind of things so mm, i think it's you. i think it's available on kindle version yeah it's a, it's an ebook on it's on uh, amazon okay. yeah yeah it's it's available on amazon so i would i would also put the link to that book on the description page and, oh thank uh, you and, uh, so I hope that people might right. And the Morinus book uh, is difficult. <laughs> yeah, this is this is the Morinus book, which was translated yeah. by James Holden sometime in 2012, or maybe published by the AFA sometime around mm -hmm. 2012. But it's it's very difficult, but I'm sure it's a very important book of our time. Yeah, and there's still parts of it I don't understand. <laughs> I mean, I just I, I've read it through several times that there's still air parts of it that I don't quite get what he's saying. <laughs> okay, uh, I got the book delivered day before yesterday and I, I just read some 30 pages in two days. So it's very, <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite complex at least. Oh yeah, you've got to go through it really slowly. It's, it's, it's dense, it's... Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So uh, we'll see you in the next video. Thanks. Okay, great.